Uh, I was born in San Francisco, but my parents uh, moved down to um, Big Sur and built the restaurant Nepenthe. And so I was raised in the country in a very, very small community on the coast. My father had studied restaurant business, but his um, real passion was having a magazine called What's Doing, which he had uh, in a short spell in Monterey, around the Monterey area. Um, and he loved that. He loved being a journalist and schmoozing with everybody. So uh -huh. that was a very exciting thing. But the restaurant was like an extension of the magazine. There was building and creativity going on, like lots of artists and writers and um, as my mother called them, rugged individualists, all kinds of wacky people. And um, on building, they were always building, building, building something, starting out by building the Panthe and then adding on uh, rooms because we needed, when we came here, it was just a log cabin with uh, two bedrooms, but we had five kids, so we had to keep adding on rooms for the other children and all the crew that was working for us. So that's my biggest thing, and it's still today even happening, is that we're constantly creating and building, adding on to this place. 1947 we came here, but it took a couple of years to get the whole thing going on about building the restaurant, and we opened up in April 24th, 1949. So today is our 60th anniversary. I learned very early on how to cook for not only a large family, but a large crew. And we never just made one batch of cookies, for instance. We had to learn how to multiply by four, and we would put, we always got all of our mayonnaise and mustard in gallon jars, and we would fill the gallon jars up with cookies. And so lots of baking, which I still absolutely love to do. Too. And my brother went to a private school, Happy Valley in Ojai, and then we, he brought back all the folk dancing, which was Russian and Israeli, and it, it was wonderful for us. We were given all kinds of classical music, and so uh, we would listen to some, and then my brother got a hold of a um, parachute that was made out of silk. I mean, it was white, and we would tell our parents when to put that music on. And then he came down, and we, us little girls, were hiding under that uh, silken uh, parachute. And we came down, and the parachute just floated and filled the whole terrace. And then we came out from under it, and then we would, we would actually do little performances, like impromptu. I have no official position. I, I used to be supervisor on the floor. I came back in, the, in my 20s to help my brother and my mom run the restaurant at a time when they needed some family on deck who they could trust to, you know, be a supervisor and floor manager. And it was only a couple of years into that that I really realized that for them it was their passion. And, you know, they just were so completely committed to all the aspects that make a restaurant. Nepenthe was really a jungle gym and a really kind of an adventure land for a kid. We'd run all over the property, uh, down to the beach, the canyon. Our parents never really knew where we were. Um, and sort of in the pre-teen era, it was just this fabulous place. We could run up and get french fries and ice cream whenever we uh, were hungry. And uh, there was just all the life of the restaurant going around and the building in the background. And uh, it was just constant activity. And there were always adults, typically other than our family members, who were keeping an eye out for us because they were busy working or otherwise engaged. And so it was a real collective, broad sense of family as a kid. was so much fun. Like, I could never wait to get back here because when I was here, I had bare feet, and my hair was long and flying, and we were always dancing, and there was always people playing the guitar and, and uh, singing around the fire, and 
just, it was very, very free and just wild and crazy. I, I really never wanted to go anywhere because it seemed like the whole entire world comes here. I mean, people from every walk of life and every land comes here. So I always thought, well, why would I have to go anywhere? And I don't want to go anywhere. I just want to be here forever. Then as a teenager, uh, it was a whole nother set of adventures because then we got to work. And then so being able to really start working different jobs in the summer and on weekends. And I always enjoyed that. And growing up in Big Sur in the 60s and into the early 70s was a real sense that we were out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, really disconnected. We didn't have television. There wasn't internet. Um, and driving a getting on the bus for an hour each way to go to Carmel, to go to middle school and then high school, really had a sense of, you know, where were we? We were out in the middle of nowhere. And yet, here at Nepenthe, the whole world was constantly coming through. And Nepenthe is not just a restaurant. It is, it is a, an extended family. It is a property. We have 100 employees. It's a gift store. We have staff housing, health insurance plans, profit sharing plans. I mean, it's like a little village. And they had this passion that I envied because I knew that I didn't feel that for restaurant management. I felt that for something else in my life, but I didn't know exactly what it was. And I felt like I was really letting them down by stepping away from being on, on deck, but that I had to find that place where my passion would fulfill itself. I like to play really loose and uh, just get some back and forth distance from it. Sometimes I'll just turn the whole thing upside down and start all over again or wipe an area out. And for a couple of hours, it's really just all about, for me, just uh, warming up. And then the last hour of a session will often be where it begins to come together and begins to really, you know, become painting. Big Sur is such a passionate landscape. It is not bucolic, it is not pastoral in a way. I mean, it's rugged and fierce and it thrashes you. And yet the serenity and the sense of connection there that you feel with, with your inner voice, with God, 
um, is so profound and, it, and it's not a lazy, sleepy place. It's, it's a place that ignites your heart. When I'm working with paintings, what I'm trying to do is really bring that experience into a visual language that gives someone else that experience. That was really fun because that was like the heyday of Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton being madly in love. And it, we weren't so busy at that time because I think that actually the Sandpiper did uh, have an effect on our business. says it means the same as Nirvana. But Kaz says it means the banishment of all pain and sorrow. I don't really know. I'm not an authority, but I'm uh, would think that uh, probably oblivion is a better translation. The Greeks, I think, thought of the penthe as uh, a state of mind induced by drugs, probably hashish. Yes, thank you. I oh, say there, Reverend. I got a friend. And he claims he gets a mystical kick from H. H? Yeah, H. So, what do you say, Reverend? You think you can find God at the end of a hypodermic needle? Cost, cut it out. Oh, well, I served in the medical corps during the war, and uh, I can't tell you how many dying and wounded men found something of God's mercy at the end of just such a needle as you described. <laughs> Because you've just been dropped. <laughs> I have some papers that Judge Thompson wants you to sign. What kind of papers? They, uh, they're related to Danny's custody. Hey, what do you say about that, Reverend? Cut it out, Cos. We got a point here, but it's all right, okay, Reverend? I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, these papers about Danny, what are they supposed to be? Well, I think you'd better read them over first. Anything you don't understand, I'll try to explain. Hey, Reverend. Uh, you can't explain anything here. Let's get out. Hey, what's the matter? Wait a minute. Did I say something wrong? What's going on? What's going on is business. Mine. Now, wait a minute. Uh, I'd like the Reverend to straighten us out on Angel. What? Come on, let's dance. We Angel. Too much seat time. Huh? Cool. This sounds interesting. Okay. Pass is getting low. Right. Yeah. This is a problem of sex. Kaplan says that angels are neutered. You know, kind of like mule. Overton says that she read someplace that angels are just like people. You know, the boy angels and the girl angels and all that kind of thing. So? Well, that's it, man, you know. What's the answer? I think you probably find the answer in Proverbs. It's uh, chapter 16, verse 22. Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it, but the uh, instruction of um, fools is folly. You go stand in the corner. I remember one day I was playing up on the terrace with my daughter Erin and she would just barely learn how to walk and she was standing up and Elizabeth Taylor came over and kind of tickled her on her head and 
they talked to me about how they had adopted a child and um, they were just really friendly and nice and that was fun. And um, then I, I was one of the extras in the movie um, where I was part of a party scene where they would get, have a big beach party with all these artists and stuff and I would be running down the path and dancing around a bonfire and that was lots of fun. I used to DJ your sign parties, and I'm pretty sure I'm part of why they don't have sign parties anymore. <laughs> What's your name? I'm Seth. Okay. Nice to meet you. Man. Nice to meet Thank you. you. Thank you. Let me get a, a shot of these handsome young lad here. <laughs> oh yeah, this is our next generation. I remember when I was four years old, somebody gave me a full set of oils, which I never used, but you know, obviously I had some potential that somebody was zapping into. Um, I made puppets and dolls and little theater presentations and would dress my sisters up and push them around in wheelbarrows with fabulous hats and things like that, you know. So we, we made our sort of own theater really, um, and that, that a lot of creativity went into that, and I think that that's when I began to really think about images, so that when I started to paint, um, there was a lot that I wanted to say on a canvas. I think my mother was really a frustrated artist. She would have been a brilliant theater director or choreographer or uh, set designer or something. You know, she had a real flair. Uh, she had wonderful collections of oriental fabrics and dishes and um, she would take us into the oriental shops and she loved that world of creativity and she knew all the people in those shops. And so as a little child, you know, I was like so intrigued by little Chinese tchotchkes and little things from Japan and so forth. And, and that was a, a big influence. And everyone always says, oh, you love colors because you grew up in colorful Big Sur. And I said, have you ever looked at Big Sur? It's actually very neutral. <laughs> you know, it's stones and old wood. And, you know, uh, there's, there's some color in the ice plant. But, you know, I, I hang on till we get to those ice plant patches, you know, where there's a nice bit of a blush of brown or red or whatever. No, it's not that colorful. There was a wonderful uh, painter who lived up on Partington Ridge, and I was living in a little shack um, trying to paint as a young painter, uh, just out of my teens, like early 20s. And he just showed up one day in his pajamas in a Jeep, 
and he said, I've decided you should come and paint with me. It's time. And he just pushed me into his car. He was not going to take no for an answer and drove me up the hill and put me through painting lessons and taught me a lot about how the Europeans looked at paintings and so forth. He, had, he was a very extraordinary spirit from the South uh, and he had this very Southern kind of romantic quality to him. And he was an amazing painter, really good painter. And he taught me a lot about observing and drawing and so forth. His name was Alba Haywood. There were very cheap places to rent that were built by prisoners who built the highway. And so they had built these, I mean, I was living actually in the, the mess hall of, of the prisoners to, that were brought there to build the highway. And so they, they put up these really rough shacks. And so I was, for $25 a month, I was getting this enormous, great, big, you know, cafeteria eating hall kind of thing as to live in, with wonderful big windows looking out to the sea. It was just terrific. I was already painting still lives. I was very influenced by um, Bonar and uh, Morandi and people like that, and particularly Bonar because he had a wonderful use of color and lush, beautiful images. Oh, I wish we had some here we could just throw into this film because he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful painter and he loved oranges and pinks and, and just uh, lush combinations of color that, that really stuck with me. You know, he was very daring about his use of color. And also then uh, Deben Korn in San Francisco had just started to uh, turn from the abstract world to painting still lives and wonderful figure studies and so forth. But his, his studies of San Francisco, row houses and um, um, big, wonderful still lives, th that was also a huge influence on me. We used to always get dressed up for the Halloween parties. But I remember the, the closest I came to really inventing costumes was painting my entire body to go to a Halloween costume in black and white, like an African sort of mad, crazy person, you know, with stripes and black and white, and everything, with poster paints. I mean, it's a wonder we didn't ruin our skin. Somebody said to me, you need finishing school. You know, you've got panache, but you need a little, you know, European culture. So England is the perfect place. Go there and get some manners. And so I went to England. Oh, this very rich man who had hired me to draw of some pictures of his house and he and his wife had this fabulous house in Hillsborough and I went there to draw and then he said, you know, my young man, he said, you know, you, you're, you're wonderful but you need your, the corners knocked off, you need finishing, you know, and uh, I think England is the perfect place for you, you should have that experience. So I packed up everything and went off to England for a three month vacation and ended up staying for 40 years. I just loved it. It was like walking into warm water. I, I arrived there and they were funny people. They had a passion and they had this old world feel. The way they were using oriental objects in their big old wonderful houses where everything was very relaxed and you know the carpets were frayed and the old chintz coverings on the couches and everything. I just loved it. It was a wonderful softness and romance. I bumped into a fellow who was designing and he had a very original eye. He was going to be the next big, big designer. And I just spotted it right away, just out of art school. And he said, I'm going up to Scotland to look for, I'm Scottish and I want to do these Scottish outfits in Scottish tweeds and I, could you come and help me pick out materials? So I went with him and as we were going across this landscape, it was the most hauntingly beautiful landscape, you know, of lichens and bracken and just kind of an old world feel and they were just beautiful colors and and the peat bogs and the wonderful wonderful great lakes that were reflecting the mountains and everything so when I got to the to the mill where he was buying this stuff there were all the colors of that landscape on the shelf in the form of knitting yarns and I thought has the world gone mad I've never seen anybody put beautiful colors together like a tapestry. These are tapestry colors. They're just ancient and beautiful. And I bought 20 colors and a pair of needles that was the size for that yarn. And I was trying to think how I would get someone to knit uh, a design for me and how I would direct this girl. And I knew she wasn't going to be fast enough. I hadn't met her, but I knew she wasn't going to be fast enough. And I thought, how am I going to sit with her day in and day out while she plods away on this sweater? And I thought, there's nothing for it. I've got to learn to knit. And I just said to a woman sitting across from me in the train, do you know how to knit? And she said, yes. And I said, could you just show me right now? 
I've got the needles, I've got the yarn, and I, she showed me how to cast on, how to knit. By the time I got to London, I was hooked. I was so excited, and I ran out and bought a little pattern for a jacket, came home, put all 20 colors in that first jacket, and just never looked back. I mean, just immediately, the first sweater I took straight to Vogue magazine, and I said, what do you think? And they said, fantastic, we've never seen anything like this before. And I said, well, I should think not. And they said, this is where knitting is going in the future. And they just started writing about me as if I was this great designer. And I just became a designer. I had no idea how to do it. And I started designing for the Missonis in Italy and so forth. But it all just fell into place. It was something that just was meant to be, obviously. What I realized with the knitting is I couldn't do things that were figurative. And what was so wonderful about um, needlepoint was that you could make flowers and all the little subtle details and the crevices and the shadows and everything. So, um, and also being able to make furniture, you know, being able to make a piece that would go on a chair. This is a chair seat. And so it's so exciting to be able to make gorgeous museum type things for someone's house. And so I did a whole book on needlepoint after doing a book on knitting. If I had done this as a kit, this is, this happens to be a once off, but if I had done this as a kit, then it would be printed on the canvas and it would be just like painting by numbers. You would get a series of yarns and you would put those, each color where it's supposed to go. Um, what's wonderful about a piece like this is I don't have to worry about, I can use 200 colors in a piece like this. You know, I don't have to worry about them being repeated or um, reproduced or whatever. If you have any inclination at all to explore your artistic side, do that. And um, you can still be a footballer or a president or whatever. I'm always very, very touched when I hear that somebody who's in politics also loves to play music or, you know, re recite poetry or, you know, to read wonderful books and wonderful thoughts. I mean, just writing is such a wonderful thing. Just that, that can be something you can do so quietly when you think of the wonderful poets like uh, Dickinson, you know, who just sat in her garage and wrote these wonderful, wonderful things which talk to us over and over and over again. Um, I mean, I'm in England where people love the spoken word and they love the written word and we have these wonderful programs on the radio, which I listen to a lot while I'm working on this kind of work. I can listen to beautiful spoken words. So you hear wonderful sets of poetry and literature and so forth, the opening windows into these worlds. So I would say, go for it, you know, make some expression, whatever it is.